turn with hymn number 573, Onward, Christian Soldiers. we have right now to go to you in prayer, to go to church, to be in church with this live stream service, dear Lord. Pray that you bless it, pray that everything goes runs smoothly, dear Father, Lord, and most of all, that you would be honored and be glorified, Lord, and that we'll just praise your holy name tonight, dear Father, for people to join in, uh, people who are not saved here in town, Lord, to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ tonight, Lord. Pray that today be the salvation for many. We love you. Praise all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, now uh, our missionaries for the week are the Jane, James and Susie Lejeune, and uh, the missionary letters should be right there on the on the screen for you. And they are missionaries to Honduras uh, since 2015, and uh, their goal is to train uh, their church planters, training uh, nationals there in Honduras. And it says, "Dear pastor, churches, and praying friends, wherefore comfort one of these with these words: First Thessalonians 4:18." The verse we chose above is, of course, to, uh, to the rapture, but in a way, these recent current events, I thought this verse was fitting because the coming of our Lord very well could be drawn out. If the coming of Jesus Christ was supposed to bring the Thessalonian comfort, how much more should it comfort us now almost 2,000 years later? Adjusting to the laws. We know that this has been trying for you all in the States, as many of you have not been able to physically attend church and miss seeing your church family. Here in Honduras, we have not been able to have a regular church service in our auditorium for about three weeks now. Instead, we've been having smaller gatherings and have been able to give quite a few bags of beans and rice to people in our church that are struggling to get by. Fortunately, where we are, there are relatively a few number of cases, but that could very well change by the time that I write upon this next prayer letter. Please pray that uh, all of this will result in, in the worldwide furtherance of the gospel. Unfortunately, all too often similar tragedies have 
prepares the fields for a massive harvest, only to then lack laborers who are willing to go. So we need to pray for prepared hearts, willing laborers, and of course, willing givers. New Life Baptist Church. We praise God for His works of grace within the youth of our church. However, there are a lot of influences and pressure from the world, so please keep them in your prayers. Kimberly, Exomora, Sarah, Wendy, Mariah, Jessica, and Mayeli, uh, family update. Abigail turned three months in March. Every time she smiles, I think to myself, ignorance sure is bliss. She has no idea about the coronavirus and is the happiest baby in the world. That's not I'm endorsing ignorance, just an observation. We thank you again for thinking and praying for us during this most trying of times. We'd love to pray, pray for you more specifically if you contact us via our email or our social media. So please keep uh, the Lejeune family in your prayers. And uh, our last song that we're going to sing tonight is uh, 427. Forgive me, we don't have it up there on the screen. Uh, but it's going to look it up on the internet or whatever. It's a popular song, Sweet By and By, 427.
And we are going to take our offering for the work of the Lord. And we encourage you to be faithful with your giving. Uh, everybody should be giving to the work of God. Now, I'm not saying this because the church is hurting financially. God is taking care of us. The bills are being paid. The needs are being met. But I want to encourage you in your faith to grow that you'll trust God while it's difficult. We can all trust God while it's good and the economy is booming and unemployment is at 3% and, and we can trust God then. Let's trust God. Let's show ourselves faithful while things are not so good and while things may look shaky for the future. So I need this money in case of tomorrow. Oh, my friend, you trust God. God has taken care of every single other uh, tomorrow for you. He'll take care of that one that are coming up for you. So there's several ways to give. Again, people are mailing their tithes in. You can do that. P P P o Box 342, Gospel Life Baptist Church, Carney, New Jersey. You can also uh, contact me. and We can drop that off. Some people do that. They just come to the building, have the access to it, and drop it off inside. Others have me come by and pick it up. Like I told you, one lady, she threw it out the window at me. And uh, also, we can encourage you to do through the internet, through our Tithely app. You can uh, donate through there as well as through PayPal. We need your, uh, to be faithful in these times. So please uh, be faithful in your giving to the ministry and to the work of the Lord. And again, while we are not having services, we are still busy in the ministry. We are still doing the things God has called us to do. And uh, trying to help people, calling people, talking to people, reaching out to people. So be faithful in all those things, and I know it'll be a blessing to you. Well, if you found your Bibles and you got your place ready, we're in the book of Philippians, chapter number 1. And the Bible says in verse number 12, But I would, you should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me uh, have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and all other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord waxing confident by my, my bonds are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ, even so of envy and strife, and some also of good will. The one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What? Then, notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. For I know that this shall turn to, uh, to my salvation through your prayers and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation of my hope, that in nothing shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what shall I choose, I what not. For I am in a strait between two, betwixt two, having desire to part, and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for the fervent and joy of faith, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ, for by me, my coming to you again. Let's pray and ask God to bless and meet the service needs of the service tonight. Father, we're thankful we can be here. And Lord, thank you that we have the internet that we can have today and uh, have services. Lord, in days gone by and previous times, like the uh, Spanish influenza, the churches were closed and, and not able to do what we're doing. So we're thankful for this opportunity. Lord, help us to make the most of it. Let us use this avenue to preach the gospel and to see people saved. And that the saints of God will be encouraged and challenged tonight. And God, again, bless tonight. Help me say what only must be said. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In this little message tonight, I want us to talk about keeping focused on the main thing. Now, Paul in this book is talking about joy and how we can have joy while we serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, too many of us, joy is what depends on what's happening in our life. And can we be joyful during this time? What's going on? Um, you know, you pay attention to the news, you're not going to have joy. You think about the economy, what's going on, and, and people losing their jobs, and people losing their businesses, and, and uh, how this is affecting. We see politicians and the crazy they're getting, and the power going to their head, and doing things that they have no absolute constitutional authority to do, and uh, people being arrested and ticketed, that, that, that will ruin your joy. 
That'll take away your joy from you. So what do we do in these times? How do we act? And what is our joy dependent on? Well, Paul takes a, 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 a slight departure in his letter to the Philippians uh, on the problem of joy, and he's going to focus on two problems. And if we get these two problems fixed and straightened out, it's going to help you with your understanding of what joy is and how we can have joy. First of all, the, the, the first problem he identifies and talks about to the Philippians is the progress of the gospel outside the church. The progress of the gospel outside of the church. Paul is in prison when he's writing this. And uh, as he's writing this, he, is, uh, he, did not, he, he did not see himself as a prisoner. Understand that. He's in prison. He is a prisoner. But he did not see himself as a prisoner. Instead, what's he see himself as? He saw himself as a prisoner. His whole ministry was a prisoner for the Lord Jesus Christ. He did not see himself as a victim. And if you go through life identifying yourself as a victim and always playing the victim, and, and, and woe is me, you can never be victorious in your Christian life. You can never be happy in your Christian life if you always play the victim. Paul here did not see himself as that. He saw himself as a conqueror in Christ Jesus. Look, if you will, at the book of Acts, chapter number 28. Acts, chapter number 28. Let's see what Paul has to say here about his bonds and what he's going through. In Acts 28 and verse number 20, Paul says, For this cause, therefore, have I called for you to see you and to speak with you, uh, because that for the hope of Israel I am bound with this chain. Paul said he was bound with this chains. Now keep that in mind if you look, if you will, at the book of Ephesians, chapter number 6. Ephesians, chapter number 6. Again, he says that he's bound with chains, that he was physically bound with chains. Now, as he's talking to the, the church in Ephesus in uh, Ephesians chapter 6, for, in verse number 20, he says, for, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, and therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Here he says he's an ambassador in bonds. The, the, this word he uses here for uh, was a, it's a, it's a uh, Greek word, that has to do with a small length of chain bound to a prisoner's wrists uh, uh, to keep him from escaping. Just imagine, Paul was bound to a Roman guard every single day while he was in jail, and while he was there, and uh, there was no way that Paul could have escaped and gotten away. He, was, and he is a prisoner, he's bound by those chains, but there we see he's gonna be doing this for two years of his life. Can you imagine being bound to somebody for two years? of your life. and well, So what does he do in that time? What will Paul do while he is bound in chains? Well, he is an ambassador for Jesus Christ, so he is going to be giving the gospel to every Roman guard who is there with him. He will be sharing the gospel with them. He's not going to be asking about his lawyer or, or has he heard from the, the governor for a reprieve. He's not going to be talking about any of those things. He's sharing Christ. Can you imagine those guards being chained to Paul? Either they got saved or they went crazy. You know, either they listened or they said, don't make me be chained to that man again. He, he wouldn't shut up talking about Jesus Christ. And isn't that what we're supposed to be doing, just talking about Jesus Christ? Paul spread the gospel through those, those Roman Praetorian guards there, the elite Roman force, and, and gave them the gospel. So here he is, an actual prisoner, but he said, I didn't see myself as a prisoner. I was an ambassador. I was a, I was a prisoner for Christ, and I was doing his work and, and doing his labor and trying to serve him. All those things, he says in verse 12 of Philippians, happened to me. Why? For the furtherance of the gospel. Now, maybe I've said this before, and I'll say it again tonight. Uh, it's worth repeating. While we have this moment in time, while the things are shut down, and again, we all have that conspiracy little bone in us that we all wondering and we're all thinking, we all got our ideas and, and we all got our, you know, whether you're left or right, middle, no matter what, you all got an idea about something that's going on with this. You just, we just don't think, well, it's a virus, it's gonna go away. We all got some, something in the back of our heads. But let's, you, you can't focus on that though. We have to stay centered on the main thing. And the main thing is always not 
uh, is the country going to go to pot? Not are the liberals taken over, are the conservatives taken over? This is a coup by Donald Trump. No, the main thing, my friend, is Jesus Christ. Are we focusing on Christ? You know, God is having his perfect will and way through this, through this, whatever you want to call it. I don't believe it's a pandemic. Well, maybe you don't, but God is still working in it. Maybe the whole thing uh, is, it, you may think is a phony and, and isn't real and, uh, and, and is something else causing this. And, and whatever you think, no matter what you think, as a Christian, your focus is to be on Jesus Christ, not the Chinese, not the White House, not, the, not Mario Cuomo or any of those other people. Your focus is on Jesus Christ. Paul wasn't in Rome saying, you know, how can we reform Rome? How can I get to Caesar and see if we can get past some laws and maybe loosen up on the slavery issue here in this country and lighten up on the Jews? No, his idea was let's get the gospel to people because everything will pass in time. And what's going to happen is the cause of eternity. Now, I'm not saying we, ought, we shouldn't stand up against what's wrong in life and, and just sit back and, and do nothing, but I am saying that too many of you are concerned about the political aspects and you're doing absolutely nothing for the cause of Christ. Absolutely nothing. We as Americans can be involved in politics and we can write our congressmen and senators and we can even stand outside the, uh, the town hall with a sign and, 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 and protest. We can do all of those things. But my friend, you are to be, while you're at the protest meeting, act civil and hand out the gospel to people. Let's talk about Christ. Paul was there in Rome and he says, I used that time as a prisoner to further the gospel of Jesus Christ. How are we using this time to further the gospel of Jesus Christ? In Paul's day and time, he was guarded by those men and he was going to give them the gospel. He's going to give the gospel to the Praetorian Guard. He's going to give it to the, all the workers in the palace and to the emperor himself. And all other places Paul goes, he's giving the gospel to people. And so again, it's the idea, uh, and this departure he's taken from the idea of joy is listen, if you're focused on the things of this life, if you're focused on what's going on around you, you will lose your joy. You have to stay focused. You have to keep looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. One of the surest measures of a Christian's spiritual maturity is what it takes to rob him of his spirit-bestowed joy. You see, joy comes from the Holy Spirit of God. He gives us that joy. It, joy does not come from circumstances around us. Now, it may provide joy or happiness, but true joy during trials is what the Holy Spirit of God gives us. And Paul is showing his maturity in his faith because he is, he, even though he is an unpleasant, he's in a difficult and painful and life-threatening circumstances, Paul did not allow those things to rob him of the joy that he, uh, he could have in Christ. Joy is a gift from the Holy Spirit of God. Well, how do we lose this joy? What would cause the Holy Spirit of God not to give us true joy? Well, of course, it's sin in the life of the believer. If the believer has sin in his life, we will not have joy. Why? Because that corrupts our fellowship with God. And if that fellowship with God is corrupted, that's the source of our joy. If that's corrupted, joy will be cut off. Sinful attitudes, and what are some sinful attitudes that will disrupt it? Well, first of all, can I talk, what is the biggest, the biggest sins? Well, first of all, bitterness. Bitterness is a very bad sin. I'm, I'm, I'm doing a lot of, while I have some downtime, I'm doing some work around the building, and, and, and I designate days and hours to do that, but I'm spending more time in the Word of God and studying things and getting involved in, and trying to uh, make this a feeding time for myself so that when people do come back to the building we and I'm able to go back out into the streets and do uh, a lot of those things, uh, I, I, I fed myself on the Word of God. I encourage you to make more time for those things. But I was, as I studied bitterness and, uh, and looking at some books on counseling and reading about Christian counseling, is it, it, most people issues in their life that they, that they have issues, all kinds of issues, really goes back and the root problem always, most times, is bitterness. Bitter at somebody that they haven't gotten over that and it's affected them. And we can't be productive in our Christian life if we're going to be bitter. It will ruin our joy. We'll have that bitterness in us and this flow of joy from the Holy Spirit of God will not last. How are we bitter at people? 
Sometimes we get bitter, at, you get bitter at these circumstances. We, we, we wanna go back to work. We're worried about our country. We're worried about our finances. We're worried about the economy. We're worried about our neighbor. And we become bitter at, at this. And what's going on, we can't allow that to happen. God's in control. Maybe it's dissatisfaction. We're dissatisfied with the things in our life. We're dissatisfied with the place and position of our life. And we don't think we've got a fair shake from the boss and other places and things in life. And we get become dissatisfied. We've got to be careful with that uh, sullenness. To become sullen. The doubt and fear and negativity in our life uh, cause joy to be forfeited. Because we're not allowing ourselves to stay focused on the Lord. And that, therefore, our joy is robbed. Joy, again, is a gift to every believer that's administered by the Holy Spirit of God. And joy is not always full. Paul, I'm sorry, John writes in 1 John 1, 4, says that, I'm writing to you that your joy may be full. Now, why is he saying that? Because apparently it doesn't always stay full. We allow it to run low because sin begins to creep into our lives and we allow that to, to affect us, to affect our moods, to affect our position, and to affect what we're doing in life, and then we lose our joy. We say, the joy of the Lord is my strength. It's a song we sing. And we need to realize that's a true little song, even though we sing it with the children. Now, anything other than sin, no matter how difficult, painful, or disappointing, need not take away the believer's joy. Yet even minor things can do that for the for for the believers uh, if we we react sinfully to things in our life and we have the wrong attitude towards the things that are going on in our life. How often do I allow it to affect my life? How often is my life affected? And I, you know, you're trying to get somewhere and you get stuck in traffic. The next thing you know, you're screaming and yelling at the traffic jam, and you really can't do anything about it. You're stuck there with everybody else. And uh, then some guy comes along on the shoulder of the road, and that really aggravates you. And, uh, and so you, you, you allow things, instead of saying, you know what, I'm in the will of God, I'm trying to serve God. If God wants me stuck in traffic, then well, there's a reason for it. Sometimes God brings people into your life. Maybe you work with people, and you think, I, I wish this guy would quit and go away. I wish this guy wasn't working with me. I wish this guy wasn't in my class. Oh, my friend, think of, you got to think of it, you're thinking wrong. you got to start thinking, maybe... God put this person here for a reason, and I am to learn from them, I am to minister to them, and I am to use this in my life and find out how God wants this for my life. So again, believers are not exempt from problems and difficulties. We're all going to face them. This is a hostile world. It's always going to be hostile, and it always will be hostile towards Christians. And uh, we see that, you know, a Resurrection Sunday with a, uh, the governor of one state uh, sending his little spies in there to get people's license plate numbers and, and tickets and somebody else scattered uh, nails in the parking lot of a church and, and uh, that would make you bitter. Well, we can't. We've got to learn to deal with these things. Believers are not exempt. Jesus said, uh, in this world you shall have, what? Tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And so the believer is going to have these tribulations, but we've got to learn to look at them through the lens of Almighty God. I want to bring you to the second thing. So there's the problems that are outside the church, outside your life, outside Christianity forces that are going to try to destroy your joy. And Paul talks about them. In this case, I'm a prisoner. I'm in jail. But it doesn't ruin my joy. It's not stopping me from being joyful because that's not the source of my joy. If we put all of our eggs in one basket, if a human being is the source of our joy, eventually we will be disappointed and be hurt. If we put the source of joy in things, when they grow old or break or wear out, we will, again, suffer lack of joy. So there is, in this case, as we're looking at here, there is the, uh, the progress uh, what's going on outside the church, but what about the things that go on inside the church? What about the things that are going on there? And one of the most dis discouraging experiences a Christian can ever go through, the servant of God can ever go through, is that of being falsely accused, not by the lost world, but by the believers themselves. 
being mistreated by believers themselves. And how often do we have to uh, see this, not only in Scripture, history, but maybe in our own lives, we've been mistreated by a believer, to be maligned by a believer, to, is to be expected, uh, to be maligned by a uh, uh, that we don't want it to be there, but it's going to happen. We expect it from the lost world. We expect the crowd that hates God to malign us and to destroy us. But we sometimes it bothers us when it happens from, from our own brethren. The psalmist deals with this. It's my own familiar friend who uh, raised up against me. We see the psalmist decrying that. But in this part of Philippians, Paul deals with that topic of being hurt by somebody that's supposed to be a believer in the gospel. Notice what he says here. Verse 15. Some indeed preach Christ, even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. The one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely supposing to add affliction to my bonds. Paul here is talking about what he was going through. And he talks about... Uh, Envy and strife that he is facing here. Uh, look, if you will, uh, verse 16. The one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely, uh, of, of supposing to add to my affliction of bonds. Verse 15. Again, some of these preach Christ even of envy and strife. Some preach Christ of envy and strife. What is he saying here? Do you realize that there were preachers in Paul? Now, buckle your seatbelt. This is going to come as a shock to you. But there were preachers, pastors, and evangelists in Paul's day that did not like the Apostle Paul, that they were envious of him, and that they were also causing strife. Envy and strife. Now, these were not heretics. These were not the Judaizers. These were not false teachers. But these were people who were theologically sound people. People who were preaching the gospel. People who were declaring the gospel message. People who were trying to get people truly born again and saved and coming to know Christ. Uh, these were not false apostles. These were not deceitful workers. These were not uh, wolves in sheep's clothing. These were the genuine thing. Uh, as Paul talks about later on, to be sure, again, Paul is, 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 is taking us here to this place not because he's trying to get us to be mad and angry. He's letting us know that even in Christianity there are going to be people doing wrong things. And if you're not careful, you're going to let those people destroy your joy. They're going to take away your joy. He says, here I am, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I'm serving God. And I got people in Rome, preachers in Rome, that are in their churches talking bad about me. Now, what could they say bad about Paul? Well, there's a lot of things they could say. Well, they could say, one, hey, the reason Paul's in jail is because God is done with him. God got tired of, his, of him and what he was doing, and God knows he's filled with pride, and so God had to punish him and put him in jail. Well, how do you know they said that? Well, isn't that what Job's friends said about Job in the book of Job? Well, Job, you're just filled with pride and arrogance, and, and you've done a lot of bad things. Therefore, God's judging you, and God's punishing you. Be careful what you accuse or, or, or think you know the mind of God. Always be careful. You don't know what God is doing. And God, somebody's going through something. doesn't necessarily mean they've done anything bad. God is doing something there in their life. You need to be careful what you say, lest God look at you and bring his wrath upon you. Because you don't know what God is doing. So Paul is talking here about those who are preaching with envy and with strife. And again, how careful we, do, we need to be. Verse 15, again, he uses that word envy. And envy is that word it means to deprive others of what is rightfully theirs. To wish that they did not have it or had it to a lesser degree. We become envious of somebody. Well, why do they get the nice car? Why do they have the nice house? Why do they have this? And why do they have... And what we're really saying is, I wish they didn't have that, and I wish I had it more. I wish I had that. That's what it comes down to. We're envious. 
And envy is a bad thing. God hates the sin of envy. And, 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 and it was because of uh, envy. Uh, they hated the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew's Gospel. The chief priest and all of them envied Christ because of the attention he was getting and the fame he was getting. And so what did they do? They sought to destroy him. He didn't do anything wrong, but they were envious of him. And if we are envious of another believer, we're guilty of the same sin as the Pharisees, Sadducees, and the mob that killed Christ. It's the same exact sin. Just because a Christian commits it doesn't make, make it a different sin. It's the same sin. You know, there's not a, there's there's Christian adultery and then there's unsaved people's adultery. No, it's it's all adultery. And just like envy is envy, whether a Christian's committing it, well, why can't pastors get, get bad at this too? Why does that guy have the big building? Why does he have more people? Why does he have a nicer church? Why does he have the nice vans? How come they have big offerings? How come they have this? And how come they have, come they have the parsonage? And we become envious. There are people who envy what I have. I'm going to tell you, look at myself. Like, I've got the smallest building in town. And yet some, I have more than others. And, I, and I'm not envious of anybody that I can think of. I'm glad that other men have buildings and, and they got big ministries. And I try to think that we're all on the same team here. And now I may look at their buildings and say, well, I wish I had this, but I'm not, I'm not saying I don't want them to have it. I would want a bigger building with more people and, and, and more stuff. But I'm not envious in a, in a sinful way. I hope that makes sense to you. I hope you understand that. But these people, Paul's here, he's talking about, is people are envious of Paul. And, and how bad that is to be for a preacher to be envious of Paul and to speak bad about Paul in a public manner. To tear Paul down in their pulpits while he sits in jail, and he's much, in, as much in the will of God as these preachers were. And young people get envious of somebody else in school. Why the, the teacher favors them? Uh, they're, they're smarter than me, and, and we become envy, and, and or we somebody has something nice, and we and we destroy it, or we try to damage it because we're envious of it. They're trying to destroy Paul and, and hurt Paul. Among many evil characteristics and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness is envy. Listed besides greed, murder, strife, deceit. Look, if you will, to Romans. Go to Romans. Let's look at there. I want you to see this. Book of Romans, chapter 1. These are bad sins that Paul lists here. He says in verse number uh, Romans 1 verse 18 for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness because that which may be known of God is manifested in them for God has shown it to them now he goes on and he's he goes on to, to talk about the people here and, and he lists the things that men are guilty of verse 28 and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with what? All unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness. Notice that what? Full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, backbiters, haters of God, deceitful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, Unmerciful. And all that list of sin, of all that list of bad things, what does God throw in there? The idea of being full of envy. God says envy is just as bad, it's just as bad and wicked as fornication and covetousness and murder and, and, and all those things. Envy is right there. And here Paul talks about in his day in Philippians how these Corinthian, I'm sorry, these Philippian, I'm sorry, let me back up again, in Rome and maybe other places where these preachers, and Christians who were envious of the Apostle Paul. So it's a bad thing. And Paul reminded Timothy, I'm sorry, Paul reminded Titus in the book of Titus that we were all, all once uh, foolish, disobedient, uh, and in that list of sin he talks about envious. 
We ought not to have envy in our life. Why? Because the believer possesses a new nature. And we are commanded by the Spirit's power to put aside all of these things, all of these sins that we put away from us. And it goes without saying that the Christians frequently fail to obey, be obedient to the Holy Spirit. And, and we're, we have failed to be obedient to the Word of God. And therefore, we have no joy in our life because the flow of joy has been cut off because we find ourselves full of envy. And as Paul addresses the Philippians here, he says, here I am in prison, and people are out there, and they're envious of me. To the point that they, they're glad that I'm here in jail, and they're, they're, they, don't, they don't like me. And how careful we need to be. Envy, again, wishes others didn't have those things. Envy wishes others maybe went without something. And how careful we want to be careful. He says in verse number 15 again, envy and strife. What is strife? Strife uh, refers to contentions, especially with a spirit of enmity. Enmity is the idea of anger and uh, 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 making somebody your enemy. It, it's associated with envy and jealousy as well as other sinful passions. Envy uh, it leads to competition, hostility, and conflict. Paul's purpose in confronting this issue was not to gain sympathy for himself. He's not saying, oh, feel sorry for me. Uh, people are out there envious and causing strife. That's not what he's doing. He is, he's telling these, he's pointing these things out to the Christians to that, you know, in the ministry you've got to be faithful because you're going to have these people on, on the side of you. You've got to keep your focus on the main thing. If you get focused on the envious people and the strifeful people, if you get focused on your situation, if you look at the surroundings, your joy will be cut off. I'm here in jail, I'm just I'm, uh, and it'd be easy for me to lose my joy because I'm in prison. It'd be easy for me to lose my joy because I got these preachers, my, own, my brethren, who are doing damage to me, who are trying to hurt me. I don't understand Christians who spend their time on social media trying to destroy other preachers. I have to realize the false prophets. I can understand the Benny Hens of the. By the way, where is Benny Hinn? With this pandemic, isn't this his moment to shine and do something with the rest of those guys? I mean, really, shouldn't he be out there doing something right now? Where is he? Did he drop dead? Did I not hear about that in the news or something? But, you know, uh, I'm talking about the people that of our, of our strife, the people who use the same Bible, the same people. And yet we spend our time, so-and-so is a compromiser because he, you know, he's got a, he's got a screen on the wall. You know, well, you know, there was a day in time when they didn't have padded seats. I'm sure they'll probably call us compromisers and, and, and other things. Somebody's preaching the gospel, they're not my enemy. If somebody's genuinely getting somebody born again, they're not my enemy. I'm not going to spend my time on social media trying to destroy them. There's enough other groups that out there that I could spend my time trying to uh, punch a hole in their armor and sink their ship. I mean, there's the, there's the whole lot of crowd out there that's wicked and evil that, that they, they are doing damage to society that need to be sunk. And they have to be taken out and stop shooting the people on our side. It's not good. The world sees us fighting. Look at those Christians fighting against each other. Be careful of that. False teachers come in, they destroy churches, that's true. But let's not destroy people that are genuinely, I don't have to fellowship with somebody. I don't say, yay, I support you 100%. And I may not agree with the music they're using. I may not agree with the, with the things that they do, but I, they're not my enemy. I am still for those people. Paul in prison could be victorious. Paul could have his... Uh, believers attacking him, yet he was victorious because he was focused on the right thing. And he wasn't going to let a sinful attitude creep into him and destroy his joy. And yet we let that happen to us. And maybe a lost person does condemn us. And we get, that person's after me and I'm going to, our joy's gone. That person in church, they, they did something. They know I like to sit in that seat and they sat there on purpose and then our joy's gone. And, and other foolish things that really don't amount to a hill of beans. I really don't know where the expression came from, but we use it all the time. <laughs> if I had a hill of beans, I'd probably eat them, amen? But listen, what are we doing? 
especially with baked beans. I like baked beans in the smoker myself. Some of you may like them. Never mind. Understand, listen, we've got to focus on the main thing, amen? Stay focused on what's right, and otherwise uh, we're going to lose our joy in our Christian life. Now, we'll end it here. Look at 1 Corinthians 13. We'll close. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And Paul is demonstrating something, and it has to do with this idea of envy and strife. People that are envious of others, they're filled with strife over others, and we're allowing bitterness to creep into our hearts. Uh, those are bad sins, though. But Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, verse number 1, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, and that word charity means love. It's agape love. I have become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mastery, mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not ch charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to burn, and have not charity, it profited me nothing. I don't, what does he say? In 1 Corinthians 13, he's, he sandwiches this, this between chapters 12 and 14, of course. But chapter 12 and 14 have to do with spiritual gifts. And he puts this idea of, of love in here. That as Christians, if we can have all the spiritual gifts in the world, but if, if it doesn't flow from a heart of love then really our gifts really don't amount to anything. We have to have love, and when we use our gifts with love for people and care for people and worry about people and pray for people and concern for people and, and, and love for God, and then our joy and our, our gifts can be manifested. Well, we can't have joy if we are genuinely demonstrating agape love in our life. And again, this is per uh, personal love. We need to have a personal love for Christ, and then Christ's love flows through us and provides joy. But if we allow the circumstances around us, both on the outside of the church, and then the troubles on the inside of the church to, to affect us, then we can't have full joy, and we'll be uh, miserable in our Christian walk. So let's learn to talk with God and, and have him search us and try us, and see what sinful ways are in us, that we can confess these things, get them made right, and, and, and always watch for the supply line doesn't get cut off by our sinful attitudes to creep into our life. Father, bless this time and this hour now, and help each Christian who's listened and going to listen. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you have a prayer list tonight, I encourage you to take out your prayer list. Ethan is going to be looking at his phone and uh, on Instagram, as well as on Facebook. Excuse me one minute. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, please uh, start typing out some prayer requests if you have them, as we will take your prayer request uh, and continue to pray for the needs that you have as Christians, and uh, the Lord will help you with those things. So be typing them out and send them up there. And Ethan will get them. This way, the other church members who are watching will be able to see this. If they watch it later on, they'll be able to see these things and be praying for the needs that you have in your life. No prayer request yet? Don't let your eyes be on that. That's right. You're a few minutes behind me right now. I have to remember that. I may have mentioned Sunday night service is on YouTube. It's not on Facebook or Instagram, but it is on the Sunday night service. So please watch that. And be blessed to you. Miss Robin says, pray for uh, her daughter. She's a new mom now. Amen. Summer's a new mom. Praise the Lord for that. That's exciting. I saw that on Facebook. We'll be praying for your daughter. And when we brought our first son home, we stood there in the house and we're like, now what do we do? Where's the instruction manual? said pray for the country to get back to normal that God stops the virus that we don't go into ec economic depression amen let's pray for God's wisdom and his will to be done and uh, I know brother Gerard anxious to get back to work I know I'm anxious after seeing some of his Facebook posts I'm anxious <laughs> yes um, as Carla says speedy, speedy birth for Gloria 
and for Bob's swollen hand from cat fight. Wow. I will pray for Bob's swollen hand. Also pray for Carla. She's due any day now, and her and Jeff are a little bit under the weather, so please pray for their healing. And for the blessings as they go to the hospital, that the Lord will work it all out for them. Yes, Ethan? She also asked prayer for Francisco to be healed from cancer. Yes, we got Francisco here in my prayer list. <coughs> Jeff's health. Yes, pray for Jeff's health. Yes. Miss Daisy asked prayer for prayer for her family, for everyone in church, and for the virus to go away. Amen, Ms. Daisy, and we're praying for those needs. We want to help us with those needs. So far, everybody in the church is doing well that I know of. Um, only one person in the church that attends church was sick with the virus very early on and got over it, and they're doing well. Other folks we know, family members from the church, their family and friends will suffer from it. All right. Yes. Miss Carla asked prayer for Lori's marriage. Pray for Lori's marriage, yes. All right, now listen, you can keep throwing those up there. We're going to close the service out, but you can please put them up there and, um, and we'll be seeing those. But we're going to end the service. Our family will be gathered here in prayer, and they will be praying. And so I encourage you tonight with your family, uh, get together and pray for the needs and, and of each other. The Lord will help us. Any other prayer requests before we close out? All right, well, thank you, folks. We do miss you. We really, really, really do miss all of you. And uh, we're praying for you all. If you need me, call me. Email me. Don't forget, if you want to be part of our Zoom Sunday School classroom, please email me, message me, and we will tell you how you can do our Sunday School on Zoom. Ms. Meyer asked for prayer for uh, my coworkers, family who have lost loved ones due to the virus. Ms. Myra. All right, please pray for Ms. Myra's coworkers, fam who have lost family members because of the virus. We'll be praying, Ms. Meyer. We do miss you. All right, man, folks. Thank you, folks. God bless you, and we'll all be seeing you soon.